Hi. I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Clean from Intel, who is a longtime Linux kernel hacker. He worked on the initial port of x86-64 and served as a maintainer of the x86-64 port, and he's worked on a lot of things in the kernel, ranging from file systems to performance uh, and more. Uh, so Andy, Andy will take it from here. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, mental models for modern program tuning. And I should add, I'm mostly talking about cache performance. And a few of the things I'm talking about, you might already know if you have experience tuning with caches. But uh, there might be some new things in there too. And it's also um, how to calibrate, cal calibrate it. So once you have a mental model, how to calibrate it to reality, what's really going on. And um, I'm presenting a new few new techniques. I should add, they're somewhat intel. Uh, specific, mostly because that's what I work on, um, but maybe they're useful for something else too. <laughs> okay, so first, how can we see program performance? I mean, one thing is you have to think about the program, and there are basically two models you could do it. I mean, one thing is you think in big boxes and big algorithms and, and things like this, so this is the high level. Another way you can think of it is like it's a more like an army of ants, yeah? So it's lots of small operations, and the goal is really of the program performances to get the individual ants collectively fast, yeah? So really, that, that's, um, I think that's an important view because often people are overlooking that, how to get the small things fast instead of only the big things. <clears throat> and of course, I'm not saying you should ignore the big things. Big algorithms and so on are important, but also think of the small things, yeah? So, and probably you've seen this quote before, I mean, preliminary optimization is the root of all evil. That's from Donald Knut from 1974. Um, but if you look at what he actually wrote is, Yet we should not pass up our opportunities on those critical 3%. So he says basically, don't um, optimize most of your program, but look at the 3% that are fast. Um, the problem is, is it only for 3%? Because if you look at the real application and so on, you often end up something like this, which you see here. It's, a, it's called a flat performance profile. Um, it's really bad. Um, because if you have a flat performance profile, nothing is standing out. Uh, um, the, 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 you see here the largest thing is about 3%, and most things are less than 1%. There's not really a, a real single bottleneck you can see, yeah? And for example, that's just, um, and what, for example, what Brandon mentioned yesterday is he loves cpu bound project problems, but if your cpu bound problem is like this, it's a flat profile. I mean, that's pretty hard to do anything about it, yeah? Or at least look at it. <coughs> so and unfortunately, these flat profiles are surprisingly common in complex workloads. I mean, there are some cases um, where it's pretty simple, like if you do, for example, uh, high performance computing, usually you have um, some loops which are really hot and you can really optimize the loops. But um, if you have really complex code, then often you end up with flat performance profiles. So the strategy is really, um, you have to be somewhat aware of performance when writing the code, um, and both of the ends and the high level, um, and at least for the critical paths. And I mean, you have to see how to see the critical paths. And the problem is because if you completely ignore it, so you don't really looking at performance when you originally write and design the code, um, then it often you need too many changes there to get it actually fast. And it gets really difficult if you have a flat performance profile because that's not really something you can focus on because it's all over, all over your program, yeah. So really, um, I think one way to do this is basically you need to have a kind of a mental model um, on, on performance, which you need to think of, yeah. And then at least apply this mental model and of course, I mean, some things are probably not critical. Like if it's only the internalization code of your program, you probably don't need to optimize it all that much. But other things you really need to have um, at least some model and think about performance in advance and then also have the model. And later on when you get performance results, so when you actually run it and profile it and then measure it and so on, then you also use the model to understand what the performance results means, yeah? And so really, how can you do a, like a mental model? I mean, there are basically two problems. The first is, so this is a C64, which was a really simple computer. Like when I started getting computing, the people actually used that. And <coughs> the, the interesting part is there were actually people who said they could completely understand the system. There were some people who really understood everything about the system and could optimize everything and so on. Um, but the problem is today, we have much more complex systems. So there's nobody. Nobody can completely understand the system. It's far, far too complex if you go from what the hardware does up to the different software layers and then the different um, peripherals and I.O. and everything. So it's really pretty complicated. But the problem is you have to somehow fit a simple enough performance model into your brain. 
So that's really the, the problem. Like, how do you simplify things enough that you can keep it in your brain without starting to scrap, yeah? Um, <clears throat> and here's, for example, um, you might have seen this table before. Uh, this is from Peter Norvik. Um, I think it has been floating around the internet for a couple of years. Um, it's basically um, different basic latencies for, for basic operations. And it's actually, I showed that the table is a little bit outdated. Um, and the, the, the numbers are not exactly right anymore. And in fact, they're changing all the time. So I don't really, so to say, look at the numbers directly. But I think the important part is, is to look at the orders of magnitude. So every time you're doing something, you should be aware of at what order of magnitude I am. So do I have a level one cache miss with really fast or a single operation, single instruction I can add? Or do I talk about a real cache miss which is slow? Or do I talk about lateral I.O. which is really, really slow? So obviously you have to know at least know on which, on which order of magnitude you are. That's the really important part here, yeah? <coughs> and by the way, um, the reason you see it why it's actually out there is, for example, it still talks about level two cache reference, but not level three caches. I mean, m most modern systems have a level three cache and so on. So you can see it's um, there. So, um, and again, actually I don't recommend really trying to know these numbers for the system that you're tuning on, because the problem is they change all the time. So, I mean, some numbers are pretty stable. I mean, L1 cache reference for not going to be faster. Um, but other numbers, they usually there's um, some change usually to better, sometimes to the worse, when there's a new generation. And I mean, there's new generations of CPUs every year. So it's really, um, I don't think it's, it's that useful to know the absolute numbers. Really the important part is just orders of magnitude. So another thing is know your critical bottleneck. And that's really important because it's not useful to um, optimize for something which is not holding you up. And I'm really, what I'm talking about here is mostly CPU bound. Um, I mean, it could be bound on other things. So before you start optimizing CPU a lot, I mean, you need to make sure you're not bound on something else. You could be bound on I.O., networking, GPU. I mean, there was a great talk yesterday from Brandon on how to look at these things and so on. So I'm, I'm not trying to repeat this. So I'm really focusing here on the CPU bound case. So you, um, it's, your application is computing. It's not waiting on something. Um, it, it's executing instructions. And um, that, that's what it, what's holding it up there. <coughs> So what is CPU bound? Um, on a very high level, you can um, think you can split it into three different things. I mean, one thing is poor computation. So it's computing something, um, and this takes some time. I mean, that's pretty well understood. I mean, we have a lot of theory how to do this. this is from, for example, for algorithms that we have the O-N um, notation, and we, we can do all kinds of optimization. So that's pretty well understood how to minimize computations and so on. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, what can be pretty slow, and this is often overlooked, is accessing memory. Um, that's one thing, so cache misses, essentially. Um, but it's already a lot slower. It's already two orders of magnitude slower, at least, or sometimes even three orders of magnitude. Um, and the other thing is, um, what's really critical is if you are scaling up, because the only way to get um, more and more computation done is to use more cores. And if you're scaling up, at some point, if you, unless you have something which is um, what is called embarrassingly parallel, which doesn't really have any communication and no interdependencies, but as soon as you have any dependencies and you, you you have communication between different cores, and then um, you start to worry about communication problems. And that's really the other thing that prevents you from doing more work done, scaling up, and so on. <coughs> so then, again, just let me talk a little bit about measurements. Um, just some very basic things. You basically, on a high level, again, you can do, um, when you want to measure the CPU, you can use it, uh, either measure the CPU or measure software, you can use three different techniques. So one of them is counting, so you just, add some instrumentation somewhere, and you count events. Um, and the CPU can do this too. I mean, CPUs have uh, tens to hundreds of different performance events, which they can count things. Um, essentially, counting what tells you is, tells you what happening, because it counts everything for that particular event, but not necessarily where. So you don't know where in your program is the problem. Um, and usually, also, um, it's not that useful to look at absolute numbers here, but typically you want to like ratios. For example, like how many cycles per instruction or how many cache misses per instruction so, or things like this. So, so typically, it's a ratio game. <coughs> so the other thing is what you can use, and this is what's often when people use profilers, that's the first thing they use is a, a user profiler, and they do sampling. So it's, and typically, I mean, the standard way to sample for is um, time or cycles. So you just um, sample how, how, how fast the clock ticks or how long it ticks, and then every time you take a sample, and then based on that, you create a histogram, and then you, you see um, roughly where the time is spent. Um, 
So it tells you loosely where, but not always what, because even if you know the time is, you don't actually know why it's this slow. So why, why did it take that long? I mean, you can guess. You can say, okay, maybe it's my bad algorithm, or it's something mysterious, something in the hardware, which I don't really understand. Um, <coughs> so it tells you loosely, loosely where, but not always where. And I should also and said it's actually loosely, because it doesn't always hit the exact the same spot. So I have a little bit more on that later. And the other thing is, um, usually when people do profiling, they usually use just cycles, so time. Um, but actually you can profile for a lot of other things. So you can profile for cache misses, you can profile for branch mispredictions and all kinds of stuff. Um, and often it's actually, especially when you have a flat profile, that's much more useful because often, for example, you find out, okay, my bottleneck is maybe cache misses. Uh, um, so actually I look for the cache misses all over. So it's much better to profile for the cache misses directly than just for time. And um, I sometimes compare this to the superhero. So we actually, um, I think there was a quote from Linus Torvalds. He said, I only need to profile for cycles because I just look at the, the, p the place where we're spending time and I see exactly why it's slow. Yeah? So if you're a superhero, then you can probably do that. But most of us are not, not like this. I, I'm not a superhero. Yeah? So I usually need a little bit more help. And so it's better to actually sample for something else. Um, and the third technique, um, which is more used in software, but it's also um, increasingly possible with hardware, is tracing. So actually, you, you trace everything that something is doing for some time. The disadvantage, of course, it, um, it generates a lot of data. It essentially becomes a big data problem. So you cannot analyze everything you're seeing. Um, it tells you where very accurately, um, but not necessarily what, because usually it's, it's just some subset of what's happening. <coughs> but it also can be very useful, but you have to um, know how to apply it um, because you cannot use it for too long because it's too much. So um, I already mentioned this earlier. So one problem of sampling is what is called the sampling skit. Um, so the basic problem is even if you're sampling something, it takes some time to trigger the sample. Um, and, and this is much worse than modern CPUs because modern CPUs are ha heavily out of order. So they do lots of things in parallel um, and actually takes some time to, to actually trigger the sample. So that means that even if you see a sample somewhere in a, some, some point of your program, the actual problem might be somewhere else. Yeah, it might be before or after that. And it really depends on the event. So some events can be more precisely sampled, other events can be not that precisely sampled. Um, I mean, one thing that, that really helps, um, and that's an uh, intro technology, it's called precise event-based sampling. So the, the CPU has some special support to more accurately um, and trigger a sample instead of, um, um, instead of relying on an interrupt. It takes some time, it actually internally tracks the instructions and, and, and triggers it and so on and writes some data about it. So this is, gives you uh, much less kit if you can use PEPs. Um, but um, the problem is it doesn't always work. So for example, right now it's not supported in VMs. Just something hopefully in the future, but right now not. Um, so for example, here this can be used by, if you use perf record, um, so this is uh, the Linux perf profiling tool. You just add PP usually to the event um, and you can also use other tools. <coughs> so that's something to be aware of. Sampling is not always accurate. Yeah? Then another problem is, um, what's really interesting is, so typically we have a limit on how fast we can sample. Because if we, um, again, if you think in orders of magnitude, then the, the sampling interrupt is at least, um, usually at least 100,000 cycles. Yeah, or even probably sometimes even more expensive. And that's sometimes a little bit cheaper, but it's pretty expensive thing. So the problem is, you cannot just sample at a really high rate. Because if you sample at a really high rate, um, you will do nothing but taking the sample. So you, you won't make much progress anymore. Um, but the problem is if you have, um, so you have to do a reasonable slow rate, but the problem is if you have a workload, I mean, um, that does lots of small things, like lots of small events, does something, does something else. Um, you can actually miss something if it's periodic and it's actually falling between the samples because it's a basic sampling theorem. You have to sample fast enough to catch everything. Um, and this can be a big, I mean, again, it's not a problem if you have a, a workload which has well-defined loops and does a lot of stuff in a, in a single place because then you will definitely hit it and not have this problem. But if you have something event-driven with, with small events, periodic, it's gonna be a big problem. I mean, one, one technique um, we've been using for, I mean, one thing that can be used is tracing, but another technique is, um, again, this is using um, PEPs, so precise event-based sampling. There's actually a, a way to run it without an interrupt. So the CPU directly writes some information about um, the, the sampling occurrence into a buffer. 
Um, and this way, um, we were able to get like 10 times more, uh, 10 times higher sampling frequencies. And we had some really nice results um, with problems here. The disadvantage here is um, it, um, it's not possible to combine with some things because um, for some things, for example, what people often want is a call graph. So you want to see what's the, what's the caller at the sample so you actually know what's happening because otherwise you might see, for example, mem copy, but you don't know who's doing the mem copy, so you, you cannot really do anything about it. The disadvantage right now, it doesn't work with call graphs, so you have to, there's some trade-offs here. And again, um, <coughs> yeah. So when it can be done, for example, in, in a new enough kernel, we implemented this feature in Linux, um, Linux kernel um, 4.1 with Linux perf, um, with uh, setting a, a fixed sampling frequency um, and disabling the, the, no time, the time option. So then uh, you can do that. Um, another problem is what I mentioned is when you're doing counting, so often people are using ratios. For example, this is uh, the output from perfstat, which is doing counting with perf. Um, and you see it just, I, I compute the, the ratio between, uh, I, I measure the ratio between uh, cache references and cache misses. And this is a really simple program which just is a Fibonacci. So it's basically completely compute bound. It doesn't really do any memory accesses in its hot loop. Um, but you see there still, it has a pretty low cache, cache hit rate, yeah? And actually, it is only coming from internalization code because the actual code, which is spending most of the cycles, is not doing, uh, it's not doing much memory references. <coughs> so really, the problem here is it's pretty misleading because you're looking at this ratio and saying, okay, this program has a cache problem. Yeah? So I need to optimize the cache, but it's completely wrong because you're just looking at the ratio without um, being, I mean, you could get a hint here because you see the actual, the actual numbers of cache references are pretty small. So maybe that's not the problem here. But it can be more complicated in, in more complex situations. Um, and one way um, we've been avoiding this problem is basically there's something called the top-down methodology um, that was being developed by Ahmad Yassin. Um, and it, it's um, supported in, in newer inter CPUs like since Sandy Bridge or so. So the basic idea with top-down is to hierarchically break down the problem, yeah? So you start on a top level so that these but you see at the beginning, this is um, the, the four top level nodes. So you break it down like um, front end bound, so a, a problem with instruction decoding, uh, bad speculation, so a problem with branch prediction, um, back end bound, this is anything from computation to accessing memory and retiring, which is good cycles. So I mean, there's no particular bottleneck. Um, and then once you're there, you can break it down. Yeah, you can say, okay, if it's back end bound, um, I look, it's either core bound. So there's some computation problem, or is it memory bound? Um, so there's a problem with the memory subsystem, and then it can be even more broken down in, in different levels. So it's a high cost system. Um, I should add, this is only a subset of the nodes. The actual top down can do much more. Um, I'm only showing the cache nodes here, um, but this is a basic way. Um, basically here, this is only caching. Um, so you see that the main thing that can be caching is, this is either memory bound during computation. So it's doing computation, but it's not, really getting the data. Um, or the other cases, what can also happen is um, you're front-end bound, that means the CPU cannot read instructions um, enough. And that usually happens when you have a really big program, but the big program is actually trashing the caches because it's so big. <coughs> yeah. So this is one way basically to avoid this problem. So first, you hierarchically break down what the, what the bottleneck is, and then only you look at the ratio that, that really matters, yeah? So in this case, if I would measure the Fibonacci, I would see it's it's core bound, so I ignore cash, the cache ratio because it doesn't really matter. <coughs> um, here's, for example, I have a tool. Uh, it's part of PMU Tools. It's an open source project um, I'm running. Um, this implements top down here. So, for example, I, I'm, I measured a program here. It's actually a different program. That's not the Fibonacci, but you can see that's the output. Like you, you see, it's backend bound, memory bound. In this case, it's a memory bound issue, um, and then it, it actually computes the bottleneck. So memory bound um, for this case. So in this case, I would only look at memory bound related issue and not, nothing else. Um, another way to, to look at it is of course, it can be done with time series. This is the plot there. So if you have a more complex workload, you typically can see how, how it develops over time. So is it, is it caching bound? Is it bound on computation and so on? So you can, can use it in, in different ways, yeah. <coughs> so that's one way to use it. Um, and I think that's really important. So because it doesn't really matter to, to focus on things which are not your bottleneck. So if you first find out what your bottleneck is, then from, go from there, that's, that's much more efficient. <coughs> um, so, so back from measurement 
So um, back on the mental model. Um, so one, one really concept that's really important is I think with the mental model is, is your basic performance unit. And usually, um, but I call it basically, if you go smaller than this, it's not fast anymore. Yeah? And for cache, that's typically 64 bytes. Um, sometimes it's larger, but usually 64 bytes. I mean, if you're talking about paging, then it's uh, usually 4K, but now increasingly to megabyte. Um, then if you're talking about other things like network I.O., um, then you're talking these hundreds of bytes for a single packet, or if you're doing a TCP connection, even thousands of bytes. And if you do block I.O., it's also getting larger and larger. Like it's not any faster to read 512 bytes versus um, two megabytes in, in many modern I.O. subsystems. So that's really important just when um, doing the high level design of your program, because if you um, only doing things in small chunks, so you're less than the minimum um, performance unit, you're wasting time because you're, you're getting stuff which you don't need, yeah? So it's can be really useful to do clustering um, and, and these kinds of things, yeah. So then um, I simp the simplified cache model because often when you think about caches is, I mean, you, you might be seen these diagrams with the Macy, Mesif, and all the different cache states. And um, I find them actually not that intuitive, even though I, I can't use them. Um, but I usually what I use when doing performance tuning, I use a simplified cache model. Um, and it's basically, it, from a basic thing, I mean, first think of memory. It's an array of 64 byte cache lines. Um, and any, any of these 64 byte cache lines can be in different states. And they're on, on a high level, there are two different um, high level states. The first, it can be local. Um, that means it's not shared by somebody else. Um, in this case, it can be temporal. So that means you have recently used it. It fits into your cache, so it's hot and it's fast. Um, the other case is predictable. That means it, it's not um, recently used but um, it's predictable, so the hardware can predict actually where you're going to access it. So in this case, it can give, you, give it to you faster too. And the, the third case is cold, so it's actually, it has to be read from memory, it's pretty slow, random access is terrible, and so on. Another case is communication. So in this case, um, the first thing is shared read only, that's the easy case, um, because if you shared read only, so only read only, then the data gets distributed or duplicated into different caches, um, and it's basically like local. So it can be either hot, easily it's temporal. Um, and the interesting case for communication really is bouncing. So when you're talking to somebody else, so you're um, writing something which another guy is reading or the other way around, or both are writing, then there, there, there has to be message passing between the two. <laughs> so I just let me discuss the different case a little bit more detail. So again, temporal, what we recently used, yeah? So um, what fits in the case and our working set? And again, um, it's pretty hard to actually um, figure out in advance what fits in your working set because, I mean, some people, they have cache models and some, but they're pretty complicated. Um, usually, um, you have to think, I mean, I try to keep things small, but then I tune it, what's the best cache model. So usually, the best way to handle this is to have a knob, which you can tune afterwards after you've written the program because it's really hard to predict what's, what's, what's your temporary working set in advance. Um, but again, the best performance is you want most of your data, at least the frequent data, to be temporal because you get the best performance this way. Um, another case is cold, yeah? So it's not temporal. It's either large or it's trashing. Um, it can be quite slow. It can be several orders of magnitude slow. Um, and actually, there are some, some optimizations possible there which I'm not really talking about, but one of them, for example, if you have a multi-socket system, a NUMA system, um, you can do NUMA locality so that um, and some memory on the, on the local socket is faster than socket and remote memory, but there are some more modern systems, um, for example, the upcoming CM5, which has fast memory and slow memory, so it can be also different there. Um, there's another trick, um, which is possible with Intel CPUs, um, but actually I, I cannot really recommend to use it um, very aggressively, but there's something called um, um, streaming stores, streaming lots and stores, so that, because the basic problem is if you stream for a lot of data, you tend to pollute your caches, and if you only use the data once, then, then you're losing your recent working set. And what it can be done is, um, it can be either generated by the compiler or using special intrinsics. Um, it's basically tell the, tell the CPU, okay, don't cache this, read it directly from, from memory or store it directly to memory. Um, again, the problem is if you actually reuse it, it's not in the cache. So if you write something streaming and you read it immediately back, it will be really, really slow because it's guaranteed to be a, ca a really bad cache mess. Um, but I mean, it can be useful, especially if you do something like a DSP, yeah? So you have a loop, and you're going for data and, and, and for some things like this. Another case um, where streaming can be useful is 
when you know you're gonna have a cache miss anyways because you're gonna do I.O. So you're talking to an I.O. De device and the I.O. device um, might, might invalidate the cache. So there are some cases where it's useful, but again, you have to be careful um, and maybe better leave it to the compiler because sometimes compilers can figure this out. <coughs> so another case is, um, and by the way, this is one of the states I, implement, I, I invented because it's normally not in the Mesa state is predictable, but I think it's a very useful, um, useful concept. So again, predictable means, so it's large and it's not hot, so it's not a cache hit, um, but it has a predictable access pattern and then it's predictable enough that the hardware can actually figure it out. So it can follow you and it can start prefetching in the background and get it for you. So, um, so you actually, it's, you don't have to wait the whole time it would normally take to read it from memory. Um, actually, that, I mean, it cannot always completely hide the complete memory latency, depending on how, how big the data set is. So, so it might be still a little bit slower than hot. It's probably somewhat slower than hot, hot or temporal uh, data. But and it's much better than, than poorly cold data, which is completely missing. And again, I mean, it's um, not that easy to predict, but typically just on a very high level is um, arrays usually much better than pointers. Because the problem often when you, when you do um, linked lists and things like this is um, they often tend to be predictable the first time you allocate them, but then you're freeing some memory and you're reallocating it and the free list of the allocator have been, has been reordered, and the next time it's not in order anymore, and then the hardware kind of predicts because there's not a predictable pattern anymore. So, um, because it, it, it doesn't predict based on pointers, it only predicts based on addresses. So, um, that, that's on a high level, I mean, you can even mess up arrays, of course, if you access the array completely randomly, nobody can predict this, but if you do sequential accesses and, and strides and things like this, it can be good. And a little bit more on prefetchers, and generally, they only work for larger amounts of data. So it needs some training period. So if, if at the beginning, usually it's slower, but over time, as you follow the pattern, it, it becomes faster. Um, they have support strides. So a stride means that um, even if you like do every end ca cache line instead of every cache line, it can support that. And as usually, they can do forwards and backwards. Um, so they can do somewhat complex patterns, but not too complex patterns. And there's also um, multiple streams supported. So it's, a, it's not a big number, but it's also not a small number. So um, if you're too complex, too many contacts, you, you probably kill the prefetcher, and then you will get slower. But um, as long as you're somewhat in, in, in shape, you should be okay. <coughs> so it's a basic on prefetchers. Um, I should add, I mean, caches can be elsewhere too. So um, caches often, and software often have software caches. For example, uh, the Linux kernel has a file cache, which is caching file data. And here's an interesting technique. Um, for example, if you're writing an event-based software, yeah, and um, for example, you are streaming out a file which is on disk or it's cached, um, and you, you're getting requests, and you're sending like one chunk and then the next chunk, like for example, a video stream or something like this. And there would basically be two ways you could implement this into your event loop. Like one way is, okay, I have a shared file descriptor to that file, and I just do peer read, and I pass the offset every time, and every every client of mine gets the same shared file descriptor and then I just handle the offset myself. Or the other way you could implement it is every, for every client I create a new file descriptor, like a private file descriptor, and then I just let the kernel manage the offset. Yeah? And if you ma benchmark this, you will notice that um, if the data is big enough, actually the second technique performs much better. Because the reason is the kernel has a prefetcher too. So, and the prefetcher is tied to a file descriptor. So if you are you're reusing the same file descriptor of different streams, you're trashing that prefetch and disables itself because it cannot make any sense of your, of your access patterns. But if you're actually just following a predictable access pattern um, on that file descriptor, you get um, prefetcher, so the, the kernel in the background already gets the data and when you're doing the I.O., if it's not an already in cache, then you can um, get better performance. Um, another thing is um, when thinking about caches is we can do um, so the hot loop model, that's really the classical model, and I think that's what Groot was thinking about, probably when he wrote his, um, his famous quote. So we have a hot loop, and we understand everything about the hot loop, yeah? So we see it in the profiler, we have the complete source code and everything. Um, I mean, there are lots of techniques there to get better cache efficiency, and actually there's techniques called cache blocking, where you reorganize the loops, um, that, that, uh, that the data access pattern is always in, in um, large, uh, larger chunks. So, um, and there are lots of tricks to do this. Um, 
in, in many cases, actually, compilers have been optimized for this because this is a classic pattern in, in high performance computing code. Um, so often, if you enable a high enough optimization level, it can't even, might be able to do this automatically, like reorganizing your loop that it fits better. Um, that's really nice if it works, um, because somebody else does the work for you. You don't need to do it yourself. Unfortunately, a lot of software is not like this. You don't have that hot loop. Um, it's all over. So, um, I mean, it can be useful, but often the hot loop model doesn't really work all that well. Um, another thing is, which is, in my experience, more common, especially from my experience, often I work on the kernel, Linux kernel. And the Linux kernel, one way to think of it is like a library. It has system calls and it gets called by somebody, but it does stuff on behalf of others. So it's a library, largely. Um, and I mean, there are other libraries too, like you might have a database library which provides data to the application or some other library which, which does something. Um, so it's called by random other code and you actually often don't know what code is calling you because you are a generic library, yeah? And the problem is the other code has its own cache footprint already. So even if you're optimizing, for example, you optimize your library, you use the caches perfectly, but then somebody else calls them regularly from another code which also uses the caches perfectly. Um, then, I mean, you, you're using twice as much cache, so you will be trashing. That's really bad, yeah? Um, and there's often like, often you can do trade-offs when you write your code. Yeah, you can trade-off say, um, I compute more, or I look it up in a table, or have my own cache. And it's typically a, a trade-off on the footprint, yeah? So you can say, okay, um, I use more cache, and I, I can afford it. Um, but the problem is, it's a, it's a tragedy of the common, because if you use too much cache, and the other guy also uses too much cache, then, then nobody gets good cache that's right, so it will be trashing. If, if both together fit into the, um, into the caches, then everything will be temporal and good. Um, so this is really bad because it's a, um, what's called a non-composable problem. So it's not that um, you look at a single thing and you can decide it, but it's really you need to look at everything together. And these, I mean, these are the hardest problems um, in, in computer science is where you have to look at everything instead of just a single thing, yeah? <clears throat> and actually, I, I wrote a long essay on the topic, how to think about this, if you're interested, it's on my blog. Um, but um, one way, I mean, to do cache-friendly libraries is, um, first, and this is actually often a technique that the Linux kernel uses is, you might assume that you are cache called, that nothing what you do is temporal, because you get called by somebody who just cleared all caches. There's a cache pick, cleared everything, I mean, in this case, the only thing you can really do is minimize footprint. Try to um, um, use as few different cache lines as possible. Um, but again, I mean, there may be trade-offs. For example, if you're doing something, you accessing some cache lines or some memory, and you avoid a really expensive I.O., like a network um, transfer or something like this, um, it's a good thing, yeah? But if it's compared to doing some computation, which might be cheaper, it's a bad thing. So you really have to be aware of, I mean, what are the orders of magnitude? which I'm optimizing for, yeah? Um, I mean, the really basic techniques is cluster hot fields in data structures. And I know if you're doing something like Java, it's pretty much impossible um, because you don't know which order it is, but I mean, in C and other languages, uh, you can do it. Um, another thing is um, support big and small versions, yeah? So because I think one, one, that one of the techniques that really works well here is if you have a tunable. Um, and you cannot really, when you write in a program, you don't really know what the complete cache footprint are because that's too complicated. So you cannot really predict it. And it, even then it's changing all the time because somebody changes something and suddenly they use more cache. So it's really hard. But if you have a knob and you can tune it later, um, you could even do an automatic tuning algorithm saying, okay, we have different knobs for my different libraries um, from big to small. And then I just um, try gradients and different optimization algorithms to find um, the combination of different knobs which actually makes things um, fit into caches as well as possible. Um, but there are other ways, so I think um, it's a really useful way to think of it. But if you cannot do that, I mean, try to be frugal, try to minimize footprint. <coughs> That's a really cache-friendly library. Um, another thing to be aware of with caches is um, there's something called cache coloring. Um, and I don't really want to go into details here, um, but basically the problem is that the way caches are implemented in hardware is um, a, a given address can only be um, cached in a limited number of locations. Um, and this means that if you have specific patterns, how, how you lay out your data structures, you might actually not use the cache completely because you only, um, the way it is, it only ends up being some locations and not in others, so parts of the cache is unused. Um, 
for example, here's an, a classic um, mistake that, that um, what's really bad for the cache is this. So assuming you have um, pages, like 4K pages, or so whatever your page size is, um, and you have some metadata in there. So you put the metadata at the beginning, like there's always a pointer, for example, to the next page, or something like this. And the problem is, because this is always a given offset to 4K, and it, it caches badly. So you actually, if you do that, you only use it, you typically use like an eight, depending on the cache implementation, but you use only a part of your caches, yeah? So uh, one trick you can use here is, um, you can use packed metadata instead. So if your problem is you're actually walking the metadata often, um, instead put them in a separate object, which is packed together, so it uses the cache as well, and then have another pointer um, to the pages. But of course, I mean, you have to be, um, it has to be done in the right way. I mean, I'm not saying you should put extra pointers everywhere. In many other cases, it might be better to up direct embed the data, and edit it. but I mean, if you um, have a problem, for example, with the, the cache boundness when you're working these metadata structures, that's one technique you can use. So it has to be a trade-off. Um, another thing is, I mean, how do we find cache issues? I mean, first thing, of course, is to make sure you actually have a cache issue. So you use something like top-down, and you see at least your memory bound, um, and probably even bound on one um, cache level. Then, and the next thing is, what I already showed earlier, is you can count the cache misses, just look at the cache hit ratios, ratios and things like this. Um, the next thing is probably is to sample for cache misses, and for example, in this case, I sample for uh, three cache misses. Um, and I should add, um, so I'm, I'm using Linux Perf here, so it runs on Linux, um, but Linux Perf doesn't have the full events, so actually I have a, um, a special tool called OCPerf, which is also part of PMU tools. So this is part of my, my toolkit. So with PMU tools um, and OCPerf, you can directly then specify, in this case, the memlot, uops, alfremis, retired local DRAM event, um, and it finds it out. And another thing what you can also do is, um, you can do sample addresses. That's another um, um, more advanced feature using PEPs, but basically what it does is, you can actually generate an event map, uh, sorry, a map of um, um, of ad ad addresses you're accessing. Um, the and actually tells you also for every access, tells you um, on which cache level it hit and so on. Uh, there are some keywords with that technique. You have to be a little bit careful. Um, so first, the first problem is, in theory, it's really nice to see, um, uh, to see a map of addresses. So you could actually visualize how the access patterns are of your program. But at first, it's only sampled. So you only see every N. Uh, the other problem is, um, I mean, if, the, if you're hitting something like a static variable or a global variable, then the tool can figure out, say, okay, it's in that global variable or it's in that code or something like this. But typically, modern programs often, they have a lot of data on the heap, um, so some allocated structure, and the tools don't understand the heap. So they actually t just tell you it's somewhere in the heap, but it doesn't kind of tell you um, it's that object, that type. So it can be somewhat hard to pass. But in, in some cases, it's possible. Usually, usually, you need some kind of custom tools. And in some cases, you can just visualize it and then try to see something. But it's not that easy to use. Um, another thing I should mention is on the sampling the L3 cache misses. So um, top-down can actually figure this out, so the, the top-left tool. Because what it does is for every, when you have a bottleneck, like you go back to the, um, yeah. You see the out output here, it can actually show you the sampling events. In this case, it actually um, shows you the event to sample. And there's actually even an option called um, run, run sample where it directly samples it afterwards. So it can be somewhat automated to find, to find the right event to sample for. <coughs> okay, back to this. Um, okay, how to find caches. Then another thing is, um, if you have, that's a special case, but it happens especially on very large programs, um, when you have a front-end problem. And essentially front-end problem means um, the, the program code is so big that the CPU is trashing the caches just trying to read, um, just, just trying to read the executable. Um, and this is actually, uh, it's surprisingly common on, on, on large applications. Um, there are some ways, I mean, these are pretty hard, but again, it's typically a problem which is all over. Because there's not like, if there was a single hot loop, it wouldn't be um, trashing the front end because that hot loop would be cached. So it's typically one of those problems which is spread all over, they're pretty hard. Um, First again, I mean, you can check that it is the problem is by looking at um, its front end bound and top down, so it tells you that's the bottleneck. Um, so one, one technique that works is, and this can be all done automatically, um, is by the compiler is using um, profile feedback, um, and then the profiler splits the hot code and the cold code into different sections, 
and then this uses the, the instruction cache much better because typically only hot code is executed, not cold code. Um, and so the, the cold code is not in your cache and this just helps a lot usually. I mean in this case for example I have a, um, this, this is a, um, I, I did some experiments with compiling GCC itself using, um, um, using profile feedback both using perf. So that there are two different ways to do it. One way is by profiling the, um, the executable Using, using standard profiling and then converting the data back into um, a format that the comp compiler can read. And the other way is um, to actually generate a special um, instrumented executable and then execute that. Um, you can see in this case, I mean, uh, this is GCC compiling itself and then uh, um, compiling the mother program. So I get um, up to um, about 10% win with the fully instrumented code. But the fully instrumented, the problem is it's much harder to use because if you have a production environment, um, and then it's, it's really hard to have sometimes a slow executable and a fast executable and then you need to transfer data from the slow executable to the fast executable because the instrumentation slows it down. So it's actually much easier to use the, the automatic profiling um, and there's a toolkit called AutoFDO um, which is, has been developed by Google and it's GCC5 which can do this automatically so directly profiling and then feeding back. <coughs> so that's one way and again, I mean, a nice thing about it is relatively automated. So you don't need to, I mean, you need to do some work to get this profiling to work, but it's not that you need to rewrite your code. So this has some advantages. Um, another issue which is um, somewhat common is, is what's called the noisy neighbor problem. And this especially happens when you're running multiple jobs, especially when it's different jobs on the same system. Um, because the caches, at least some caches are shared resources. Um, and what can happen is then somebody else, some other job is executing the system and it, it, it uses the cache and then you're, you're missing parts of the cache, yeah? So it's a noisy neighbor. It's basically kicking you out or, or disturbing you. <coughs> and they are, it can cause severe slowdowns. Typically the problem is, um, but, uh, typically the problem is for example, if you, it depends on what you're co-locating. So if you two have two processes which are compute bound, they are they're mostly running in, in their own caches, and only access memory much, there will be not much influence because they don't care that much about the caches. If you have one guy with compute bound, another guy who's memory bound, it's also not a bigger problem. But the problem happens when you have two guys who are memory bound because then they are, they are fighting against each other with the caches. Um, so there are really um, two ways to handle this. I mean, one, one way is because it's avoided, yeah? But the, the standard way is to basically co-locate processes with different characteristics. So if you, for example, you measure the instruction per cycle, so that's the standard way to do it. So if something has um, a high instruction per cycles, then it usually means it's compute bound. Um, and you can co-locate with somebody who has a low instruction per cycle, that's usually memory bound, because then they won't disturb each other that much. Um, that's one way to do it. Um, another way is this has been um, a new Intel feature. This um, has been introduced um, partially at the first version in, in, um, in the Haswell generation, and then um, with enforcement also in the Broadwell generation. Is it can do first cache QoS monitoring. So basically you can directly monitor how much cache it is using. And do your decisions based on that. So basically don't combine two guys when they would um, trash the caches together. That's one way to do it. Um, and there's also um, what they added in Broadwell is cache QoS enforcement. So you can actually allocate parts of the cache to specific processes. Um, and this is also, in addition to batch computing, it's also really interesting for if you have latency sensitive applications because one of the big latencies you can have is cache misses. So if you allocate some parts of the caches to the application, you might, you might have um, less tail latencies and, and things like this. So this, here's an example um, on how to do L3 occupancy me measurements. And that, this is the new feature that I talked about in Haswell. Um, there was, it wasn't really possible to do this before, yeah? So it's really like a unique new uh, capability. There was no way to actually, except for running a cache model and a simulator, but these things usually are not that accurate. So it was really not no good way to actually find out how much cache you're using. Yeah? So in this case, I, I was measuring this, uh, it's a simple um, test tool called multi-chase. Um, and it's measuring, you see at the beginning, um, that the cache occupancy is pretty high and then goes down as it goes steady state. <coughs> so this is here. Um, and by the way, before you ask, um, it, it shows fractional bytes, which is a little bit unexpected. Um, I think that's currently a, a, a bug in the tool but I think it's only a small error as far as I know, so it's not disturbing the measurements very much. Um, but this is using, again, Linux Perf. It requires a reasonably new um, Linux kernel, at least 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4.5, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8, 4.9, 4.10, 4.11, 4.12, 4.13, 4.14, 
um, so that works, yeah. And based on that one, we could do the co-placement. So we, we measure the, the cache occupancies of the different workloads, and then we choose our co-placement based on that, and then they don't have to trash caches. So there can be really um, great utilization of a, of a um, cluster and so on up. Um, so now this was basically talking about um, how to use caches when they are local. Um, now communication, that's a really interesting problem. So it's basically communication happens when a core access a cache and written by another core. So typically multiple guys sharing data, passing messages. So the thing is, um, because often, especially when people talk about languages like Rust or Go, they often say, okay, um, we don't do that much shared, shared, shared memory, we only pass around messages. Um, but in my mind, this is actually the wrong way to think about it because even if you have shared memory and you're writing to a cache and somebody else has used, it's message passing too because uh, there's a message which goes over a network. It's a really fast network, um, but it's a network and it, it acts like a network. Yeah? So that's a really important thing in your mental model is, so if you have communication, if you're bouncing cache lines, it's, it's message passing, it's, it's like a network. <coughs> and so one way of course is, how to find it. I mean, if you have that problem, again, uh, you can check top down if it has a special node for this called congested accesses, accesses. So if you don't have congested accesses, then you don't need to care about it because it's not a problem. Um, there are some other sampling events. So this really useful event, which I can really recommend. So if you have a problem with this, is, um, it's called xnoop hit, hit m. Basically it means is a, um, it gets a, it finds the cache line if it's modified in, a, in the cache of another CPU. I mean, this is why it's used the typical case is you're getting a cache line which somebody else has recently written, so it has to be directly transferred from the other guy. And there's also um, a similar um, event for remote sockets. So you need to do different sampling, one for the local socket and one for remote sockets. And I should add, um, the event name unfortunately changes, um, has changed for different intergenerations, so there might be a similar name, but it has at least x new hit m, that's the important part to look for. Um, and then you can actually find, find where they happen. So um, the first thing when you do communication is to think about the latency levels. Yeah? So one thing is if you have hyperthreading, SM SMT, sim simultaneous multithreading, then talking to another thread on the same core is really fast because they're sharing everything. So it's, it's the same cache. I mean, it's not free, um, but it's, it's, a really, it's a really low um, order of magnitude. So that's really fast. And the next level is to another core in the same socket. And I should add, I mean, modern CPUs tend to be pretty complicated. So they actually latency differences because they have a ring. So it depends on how many ring stops you do. But uh, typically, I mean, unless you really care about the latency, it doesn't make all that much difference. It's not an order of magnitude difference that you can get. But um, so, but typically in the same socket, talking to another core is pretty, pretty fast. Um, but talking to another socket, if you have a two socket system, or four socket system, talking to another socket is much, much, much slower because you get into the speed of light issues. It's, it's talking over, over a connection over the motherboard that takes much, much, much longer. Um, another thing is, of course, um, if you have a larger system, there might be multiple hops, but it's relatively rare. I mean, you'd only on large systems, you have multiple hops that is not directly connected. Um, another thing that's um, happening on, on modern Intel CPUs, so they have an um, algorithm called um, home snoop. And what happens here is the latency actually depends on where the cache line is located. <coughs> so, and that means that if it's memory, which is located in the local socket and, and another guy, like and another socket is, is bouncing between its cores, it's still, or it's still slower because it, uh, the way the algorithm works or the, the protocol works is it has to actually ask the, the owning socket, the home socket to do something and this just takes longer. <coughs> and then actually you see here, actually I did some, some measurements using the Intel latency checker, that's a, a special tool um, to, to measure these latencies. And um, you see there's a big difference between remote one, remote two, there's two difference between um, local um, ho home, so it, it's on the home address or it's not on the home address. Um, by the way, one thing I should add is, I don't recommend writing your own tools to measure these latencies. It's really, really hard to do. Um, do something what the expert wrote, that's the Intel latency checker is pretty good because it's, it's really easy to get it wrong, especially when you don't care about prefetches and there's all kinds of weird things happening. So it's really hard to measure these latencies. And again, actually I don't recommend to worry too much about the exact latency. The important part is the order of magnitude because 
the, the exact latency will be changing anyways, yeah? And it's not really constant because it depends on what the load level is on the system, so how, how much load you have on it. So, but again, the important part is really that you, you, don't, you don't miss like the difference between core to core, same socket versus remote socket, because that's orders of magnitude. That's the thing to remember, yeah? Um, another thing is what's really, really important is, so again, the caching is a network, so you do message passing, um, and that means you have queuing effects. So things can queue up, and I mean, if you ever did network optimization, you've probably seen network effects that everybody is banging on that one queue and it's filling up and there's back pressure and there's all kinds of problems. Um, it's the same with the caches, and they are actually the ordering requirements due to the way the memory currency works. So you can get into what's called a conflict, and then things can get really slow and so my mind really slow down. For example, I did a, a simple experiment here. Um, I just do um, um, increments on a shared cache line. And you see and it's a two socket system. I mean, at the beginning is relatively fast, up to well, about eight cores and even 16 cores, not that, ba not that bad. But then it gets, things get really slow as the queues are filling up and, and things are crashing. And so you really have to think of, because the interesting part is often when you do performance tuning is you don't really care about the unloaded case. Because the unloaded case is easy. I mean, the things are really fast, comparatively. But what you care about is what happens under load. Because when you're under load, under high pressure, that's, that's where you need the performance. So it's much more important actually to optimize for this case than for the unloaded case when you're under low load. Yeah? So think of um, bouncing cache lines around like a message, like a queuing problem. It's like a network. That's the important part. Um, I mean, there are some optimizations you can do, like avoid no unnecessary round trips. That's the most basic one. I mean, it's the same thing as you do a network optimization, right? The really important part when you do RPC is avoid unnecessary RPC. I mean, that's the number one rule. Um, another thing is what's pretty basic is avoid false sharing. So when you have multiple guys which are um, independent on the same 64 bit cache, cache line and they bounce. Um, so typically the way you do it is just pretty easy. I mean, you find it using the XNU PIDM event and you just add some padding. That's, that's pretty easy to fix actually. Um, then another thing is, of course, is to optimize for locality. So you really want, if you can, stay on the same socket or maybe even on the same core, if possible, um, and only go to the remote socket if you need to. So, um, so that's really because it's, there's a lot of difference, like I showed earlier here, there's a lot of difference in the latencies between core and remote socket and, and so on. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, what I mentioned is design for load, yeah? And I mean, one, one important way to do this is, which is really the similar what, what people use on network optimization is, at back offs. So when you're waiting for something, back off. Don't, don't keep banging on it all the time because that's really bad for the queues. It, it really trashes them and it takes forever. Um, and the other problem is, I mean, which is again, is a standard um, technique and I think um, Dave talked about this yesterday and for EPOL, you can avoid thundering hurt. So thundering hurt is when multiple guys are waiting for something and they get broken up and then they're all banging on it and trying to get it all together, like a thundering herd trying to get it, but only one guy gets it. That's the thundering herd problem. So you should really avoid it because it also causes trashing and all kinds of problems. <coughs> so these are the really basic optimizations you can do to um, get better message passing for the cache. And let's just let, let's look at an example here. Um, so you see these two, two different ways to write something. Yeah? One way is we have a global flag and we just set it to true, something happened. Um, and the other way is, I mean, we first check the global flag and we only set it to true um, if, 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 if it's not zero. So you would expect, I mean, just naively, the first way is faster, right? Because, I mean, it's less code, it's, there's no if, so it must be faster, right? But if you think about it in terms of caches, right? What happens on the caches is, um, if the flag was already true previously and it stays true, then the caches become shared, and it's really fast because it becomes duplicated, that everybody has it in their, in their local cache. They don't need to ask the other guy what happened. But if everybody keeps writing that, that um, global flag, then you start bouncing the cache in around because the, the CPU doesn't know it's already set to, to true. It has to rewrite it again just in case it changed, yeah? So, so you can get a much better um, performance this way if you avoid the divide if you don't need it because you are you're basically turning it from bouncing to to shared yeah which is much much more efficient so it can be 
there can be um, orders of magnitude differences in performance for these ones, especially when it's between different sockets, um, and when, especially when multiple guys are doing this at the same time. This is really a useful um, optimization. Again, um, this is really nice about it because it's really easy. Um, you can find such a problem with hit M, using the hit M event which finds bounding cache lines, and then you find this pattern in your code, and you say, okay, I just add the if, and things are much better. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about logs. So that's one, one I, I did a lot of work on logs. Um, really, it's interesting to apply these principles to logs, yeah? So you, because I mean, locking is pretty common, and there are lots of performance problems with locking. Um, typically, when people start doing, um, they have some code, and they want to scale it up on, on large and larger systems, or make it multi-threaded. Um, typically, what they do is they start with a big lock at some point, like the code lock or the big whatever lock, which you start off. And then over time, you push the lock down. Yeah? So you have more and more fine-grained logging um, to individual objects, like following the basic rule, lock um, data, not code. Um, but you would think of, I mean, if you put this to an extreme, what's the, what's the end goal? I mean, you would think of the end goal would be put a lock on every cache line. Um, and actually, there's a lot of people who uh, basically seem to think that's the right way to do it. Yeah? But actually, that's wrong. Don't do this. There's a lot of problems. Um, let me talk a little bit more. So the first problem is if you have a lock on every cache line, you have, end up with a lot of locks. So, and the problem is um, even an uncontented lock, so which is only in a local cache, um, it has some overhead. And the, I mean, if you add more and more locks, you're spending more and more time having that overhead. And um, it can dip, did, it's actually a little bit unpredictable because at least on Intel implementation is. So most of the time, I mean, the lock is maybe one order of magnitude slower than a simple instruction. <coughs> but sometimes it's a lot slower, and this is related to, um, because locks are related to memory ordering, and sometimes when something happens which forces memory ordering, then the lock has to wait until this, this thing has finished, and this can be a lot slower. So you, first, when you have a lot of locks, um, you sometimes end up with a lot slower locks, and you, often you cannot explain why, because it's, it can be very tricky to, to understand. Then the other problem is really, even if it's, 10, 10 orders of magnitude slower, uh, sorry, one order of magnitude slower than a basic instruction is. Um, if you have too many of them, they add up. So, and the way I think of it is, I think is, locks are red tape, because a lock by itself doesn't get anything done. It's just, I mean, you, it's like a bureaucrat who is stopping to do something, like you have to form out, fill out a form to do something. I mean, you want some red tape, because otherwise there's chaos, but nobody wants too much red tape, yeah? So if you, had a lock on every cache line, every object, you, you're basically spending a lot of your time just doing red tape, which is really, really bad. So you don't, really don't want this. Um, another problem with small locks is, so this is actually, um, this is a, a real comment from the Linux kernel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Hannes will know it. <laughs> so this is the, the lock ordering um, for a critical part of the memory management subsystem. Um, and it is, as you can see, there's pretty fine-grained locking. So there's a lots of different things um, have the individual locks. And as you, you probably know, um, you need to take a lock order into account. Otherwise, you get the ABBA a, problems that if you sometimes do the long lock, uh, locking order things, they're deadlocks. Um, so basically, the problem is if you have that many locks, you, you end up with a lot of rules how to take the locks. And if you change something, you have to make sure this is, you're following the rules. And this actually sometimes makes it really hard to change something, yeah? So it's really hard for the mental model to keep this in your, into your brain before it's wrapping. So that's, that's another problem with small locks. Basically, it can overwhelm you. So it's too hard to think about. <coughs> then that's really the most critical problem with small locks. So assuming you, you have really, um, you, you have really um, fine, con fine contented, uh, sorry, fine grained locks, um, and there's no contention, then, I mean, you have the overhead from the red tape, but it's maybe not too bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's somewhat bad, but not too bad. But the problem is, as soon as you get contention, then every time you're taking the lock, you have to communicate with somebody because you have to fetch the lock cache line from somebody else. Okay. And then um, um, that, that makes it really slow. So basically, you have to do more work to, uh, to, um, to, uh, to amortize the lock. Yeah? So this requi requires doing enough work on the lock. And um, I did a simple experiment here. Is I just, it's basically a, just a, 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 the hashing inside a lock and just measured how long do you make, how much work do you do inside the lock compared to um, um, com, com, how much do you work inside the lock um, com, 
um, compared to fetching the cache line. And basically, the longer to make, you make the critical section, the more work you get done. So you really have to amortize your um, getting the lock. That's the important part. So lock, lock acquisition is communication, and you have to handle it. Um, then the last problem is lock stability. Um, that's a little, little bit more subtle. But basically, the problem is um, when you have really small locks, then they tend to reacquire themselves. Um, so when you release the lock, and then the same guy takes the, takes the same lock again, so they, they stay on their local cache. But uh, sometimes, uh, this works pretty well, but sometimes when you change the timing, either you get a new hardware platform, which has different timing, or you change something in your code, um, this doesn't work anymore, and then you suddenly fall over. So instead of, um, instead of having a really fast lock, suddenly you get a really slow lock. That's instable behavior. That's really, really bad. That's something you really want to avoid. So, and we actually, we did a paper on this and some investigation, so there's a Intel white paper on this. So one thing we found is you need to do about, um, every critical section needs to be, should be about 200 microseconds um, to avoid lock instability. But the problem is, that's a lot of instructions. I mean, you need to do a lot of work. Um, one way to do is basically, you can design your libraries for lock batching. So instead of doing one thing um, and do all, take all the locks is, you batch multiple things and you take one lock and do multiple things. That's the basic way to get larger critical sections and avoid a lot of these problems. And this also um, improves temporal locality. So you use your catches much better. Um, and the last thing, so I don't really have time anymore to talk about this, is you can do lock collision. Um, so this is using hardware transaction memory and it use a big lock and then it automatically hardware figures it out. <coughs> Just very quickly before I finish is, um, one thing I want to mention is micro batch marks are really difficult. Um, so you, there are lots of ways you have to remember to fix the frequency. Accurate timing is tricky. Um, the compilers can optimize them away. But the, the most critical problem is if you do a micro benchmark to understand what's going on is um, if you call your library always with the same values, then um, you're hitting the caches because everything is the same, like your table is the same. But if you, um, that's unrealistic because the real application most likely doesn't do this. Or you could, call the library hours with different values, but it's also unrealistic because you don't have any locality. So it's really hard to write a micro benchmark which actually models what your real workload does. So that's, that makes it really tricky to write um, micro benchmarks is actually realistic. I mean, one, one new technique um, we've been using is, this is a new feature that's actually added in, um, in the Skylake CPU is, there's a, um, there's a way where the CPU can sample, um, sample and then t for, take the, for the last 42 branches um, measure and um, give you the, the cycle counts between these last but two branches. And this way you can actually look at like basic blocks and directly um, see how long they take. I call this automatic micro benchmarking. Um, so basically you can do micro benchmarks in your real production workload um, without actually um, writing a micro benchmark, which is not realistic. Um, another way you can use is doing tracing. Um, I don't think I probably run out of time, so I cannot really talk about this, but there's a new feature which has been added um, in Broadway and Skylake, so you can actually do accurate tracing for every instruction and look, looking at um, how long every function takes. And this is one tool I really use a lot to calibrate my mental model, how long does something take, so I can actually look at it. But again, you cannot trace too much. You can only trace a limited region because otherwise it's too much data, but um, this also works, yeah. Okay, so that's my summary. Really focus on the critical bottlenecks. That's really the important part. Um, remember the order of magnitudes. So don't remember latency numbers, but order of magnitudes, really useful. If you do cache communication, it's message passing. So you really want to think of it like a network. Um, lock coarsely, don't do too fine-grained locking. It's very problematic. And measure properly. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <laughs>